Hey everyone, how is it going? So I've finally done it. I've finished reading this great big mother quacker, uh, Lucy Ellman's 1000 plus page novel, Ducks Newburyport, uh, which I, as I've been talking about recently, I want to read specifically because it was longlisted for the Booker Prize, but it's a novel I've been wanting to get to anyway um, since it was published in July and I ordered it from the publisher Galley Beggar Press uh, just because something about the description of it really captured my imagination and made me want to read it and a lot of people have been talking about it and sort of bigging it up as an exciting new novel and so but as you know I've talked about with a lot of big books that I've been wanting to read um, this is a novel that could easily have just languished on my shelves for years and that I won one of those books that I wanted to get around to reading but that I was sort of intimidated of because it is so long um, but I'm so I'm really glad that the the Booker Prize you know sort of pushed me to, to actually read this right now and I'm so glad I did uh, and it's going to be a really interesting novel to talk about and try to describe my feelings for because I feel in some ways that there's aspects of this novel that just thinking about it from the outside are things that would probably annoy me and put me off from a book, but the actual experience of reading it, I found really enjoyable and engaging. And pretty much for the entire thousand plus pages, I was engaged all the way through. So I'm gonna try to break it down and um, try to talk about why I think it does really work so well and why I was so entertained and moved by it and why I found it so funny and uh, but also really um, upsetting in parts and disturbing and why it's so gripping there's some really gripping aspects of it uh, despite its you know seemingly plotlessness listness uh, if that makes sense <laughs> um, so so yeah to start off yeah it's it's a novel just uh, about a you know seemingly ordinary American housewife um, who's at home all day baking pies because she has her own sort of uh, at, at home business where she bakes pies for for local businesses and individuals and um, and she has four children and it tells all of her thoughts in one continuous stream. So it's it's uh, it's it is just everything she's thinking as she's going about her day, and it's in one long unbroken sentence. And you know it does pose that that difficult challenge, and that it is just big blocks of text that are uninterrupted, and and you know that's quite challenging for a reader because as readers we naturally like having breaks of chapters and sections and sentences at least um, where we can stop reading and, and pick up another time because um, you know it is physically impossible to just sit down and read this novel all in one go and it's um, so interesting because all of her thoughts are connected with this continuous um, phrase where she she says the fact that and she she'll um, articulate her thoughts through this this method method of saying um, the fact that that this and the fact that that um, some of which are actual facts, some of which are speculations, some of uh, which are her assumptions or opinions or just things that she's heard or or um, or these humorous statements that she's making which are really absurd and and make no sense. And so, and I like how it's teasing I think um, it's it's very clever how she she uses this as a framing device because it does make us make me like question how facts are viewed today um, because I think you know there's a lot of question about what we know is a concrete fact and what's just an opinion and our speculation I mean we rely so much on the internet and and we'll just go look something up on the internet and assume that that's a fact when you know really obviously it's not and so I think it really reflects modern experience in that way and um, and there's so much in this novel that is about modern day life um, both local of what's happening just in her own world, in her household, with her family, um, with her past, uh, but also what's happening in her community, what's happening in her country, the very politically divided United States, um, but also what's happening in the world and sort of environmental catastrophes and uh, yeah, big large scale problems. And she's this is all happen happening simultaneously. You know, we get this one continuous thought where she's having two or three or more thoughts all at one time. And so it all becomes jumbled up into one. And you might think that that's 
really exhausting and, and you know it is exhausting in some way it was funny you know I, I talk about how sometimes I'll read aloud to my partner and I read um, aloud to him sections of this I think I read a few pages and and uh, his response was just like like wow that sounds exhausting and in a way it is sort of exhausting just getting this one long continuous stream of thought but in another way it's it gets to be oddly comforting and there's a sort of beauty to it because it takes on a rhythm of itself you very quickly take on the rhythm of her her thoughts and how how her thoughts will revolve around certain things again and again and she'll sometimes go back to certain thoughts and they'll be inter interjected with um, things that are happening around her in her life and things that interrupt her as she's going about baking all of these cinnamon rolls and pies so yeah it does sort of feel overwhelming at times but but like I said once you get into the rhythm of it 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 um it just uh, it seems to really reflect it makes you reflect on the way that that this is how our own thoughts work you know we'll we'll be going about our day and we'll have inside our heads so many things all simultaneously at once and this does almost feel like a modern problem that that we have that because of the internet and because of feeling like we're, we're linked up with all these things that are happening globally, that we're simultaneously preoccupied with what's immediately happening in our life and what's happening in the larger world. Um, but it does fit in with this literary tradition, I think, you know, I mean, the, the way that she writes about this monologue, you know, it is very reminiscent of uh, Molly's soliloquy in um, James Joyce's Ulysses of just this one continuous strain of thought, but also of um, Virginia Woolf's, whoop, almost dropped it, <laughs> Virginia Woolf's uh, Mrs. Dalloway. You know how Miss Dalloway is just sort of going about her day and, and uh, like I talked about in a recent video when I was talking about Mrs. Dalloway of um, this stream of consciousness style of, of how she she's having all of her um, preoccupations about what's happening in her daily life and all of her memories while just walking through the city of London and noticing all these things and how all those perceptions will impact and reflect upon what she's thinking but also yeah how she she'll constantly retread these grounds of, of thoughts of that she's gone over before sort of obsessively thinking about and um and so yeah you would think that that would all be really um would get sort of tiring and you do feel her exhaustion with herself that she's thinking all these things over and over again but i think that makes her really sympathetic and it really tuned me to to how you know i feel that way uh, a lot of the time as well so i think it does harken back to some of these literary traditions of this modernist tradition of stream of consciousness and with a lot of modern preoccupations so something i would actually much more closely align this novel to actually is ali smith's writing and ali smith's seasonal quartet that she's working on currently you know there's been three books out of it and um summer will be released next year um you know assuming that that ali smith finishes it on time as is scheduled and it does have a lot of parallels with Ali Smith's writing, at, I think, in that there's a lot of seemingly disjointed thoughts that sort of, sort of get all jammed up together. But then there's also a lot of preoccupations with modern life and, you know, and in this seasonal quartet, how she's really trying to capture events that are happening in modern day life, how, you know, big global events that are in the news, but also the way that we live in the modern world. And so, you know, there is a lot in this novel that's about gun control um there she a lot of her anxiety and preoccupations revolve uh, around shootings in america and and uh, and gun laws and and um you know and how i mean just recently uh the, you know there was another big news story about a, a mass shooting in america um but then also big environmental concerns she she's talking um, uh, about how you know the the oceans are poisoned and how how we don't know what's in our food currently and you know and and just in a news story recently about the the um, the the rainforest in South America um, burning at a really accelerated rate and you know I, I feel like you know these are things that that she would just hear about casually as she's going about her day and she has her own local concerns which she's obviously pre 
preoccupied with, but then also gets really anxious and upset about these these bigger happenings as well. And and so yeah, it is just sort of like our our modern day experience that we have all this going in our head at the same time. But then another aspect of this novel that I have to talk about, an important sort of a, a narrative that goes alongside her stream of consciousness style is it's also told as a counter narrative in this running throughout the book interjected with her thoughts that's told from the perspective of a mountain lion. And you see that mountain lion's perspective as uh, the mountain lion is going about her day and caring for her, her young. And this, this narrative that's running alongside her stream of consciousness style, this is told in a, in a very different way where you get these short declarative sentences about this mountain lion's life. But yeah, it's, it's so interesting how this integrates with the story because yeah, just on the outside, you'd think like, well, how does that, this story of a mountain lion work with the story of an ordinary housewife as she's going about her day? Um, but it does blend in with the, the larger narrative, both in a plot line way that they um, sort of intermingle in a surprising way, but also in a very symbolic way. Um, there's references throughout um, her her story to to lines, like she has a, a, a line ornament um, from when she was younger. And um, and yeah, there's different references to lines throughout it, um, but also just as, as, a, as a different way of organizing thoughts, like, how the mountain lion is in these short declarative sentences is really only concerned with uh, her immediate life and what's happening to her as she's going about trying to find food and trying to care and protect her young, as opposed to the housewife's life where, who is sort of preoccupied with everything that's happening in the world and um, while also, you know, is consumed with what's happening in her ordinary life. And, uh, and so it's really interesting how those are juxtaposed against each other. So yeah, you get these two things and just like in plot-wise terms, it, it seems like on the surface that in plot-wise nothing really happens. I mean, she's just in her kitchen baking all day. Um, but then things do happen both in like the larger plot, which um, are quite exciting. And, and as I got towards the end of this book, I was really gripped both from the plot and just really moved, really caught up with this character and felt very, very close to her. Um, so I found it very moving. But you also get little bits throughout the novel um, because it is made up so much of just sort of her random thoughts throughout the day, but also you get little memories, little snippets from her past, and you piece together her whole life out of this. So, so you, you learn about how her, um, her parents died when um, she was at a relatively young age, and how she has four children, and she, how she had a previous marriage and a child from a previous marriage, and, and the difficulty of, of, um, of reintegrating that or integrating that, that child into a new marriage and, and a new family and having new children and, um, and all these, these memories from the past. So you get these little snippets and hints of things um, which are gradually revealed over the course of the book. So you get a much bigger understanding of her life in general, but also specific events um, that she keeps going back to and she obsessively thinks about and, and you gradually learn why she, she keeps going back and thinking about certain things, how they have a real emotional and symbolic weight in her life. And, uh, and yeah, and it's, it's funny, this whole like jumble of, of thoughts and speculations and feelings um, are also mixed with all these uh, descriptions of plot lines of films, because while she's going about baking during the day, um, she, she's also watching a lot of movies, a lot of old movies. And, um, and so a lot of films will get referenced in, in particular, um, like it's complicated that, that a relatively recent film with Meryl Streep and Alec Baldwin and Steve Martin, um, a very silly film, which she acknowledges is a very silly film, um, but it's a film that is hugely enjoyable. I, I love that film. It's, it's, um, it's really fun to watch, even though it has, it's so absurd. Um, but, but then also, yeah, films like It's a Wonderful Life and um, the, the film Witness um, with Harrison Ford when he's in an Amish community and um, yeah, a lot of old films and a lot of old musicals. And she'll go through sort of the, the plot lines and lines from these films will be interjected in, 
into all of her memories and thoughts and feelings as she goes about her day. And I did feel sometimes the, the lengthy descriptions of the, the plots of these, these films did go on a bit too long. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, on the whole, um, I really enjoyed how they were all mixed in and integrated with it just because um, there are a lot of films that I've seen, or there, there are some films that I haven't seen as well, um, but I still enjoyed how sort of the, the plot lines of these films get mixed in with the plot line of her own story and, and, uh, and there's you know, little, a little joy where just uh, a line from a film will, will suddenly um, get interjected into the narrative and uh, you might know that that's a line from a particular film and, and so you know, that gives a little teasing pleasure to it. Um, but there's also a lot of literary references in this. So there's um, a lot of references to Dickens and Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, a lot about Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, I, I talked before, it's sort of coincidental that in my recent like uh, video about big books that I wanna read, one of the books I was talking about was this um, biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder, Wilder called Prairie Fires, which I haven't yet read yet, but I wish I had read because, uh, yeah, there's so many references to her. I wish I knew more about her life. So I sort of, I feel more motivated to go back and read this now um, so I can sort of better understand uh, this novel. Um, and so, uh, but, uh, but it's funny because, uh, yeah, I think her constant hearkening back to that and sort of literal house on the prairie is sort of, almost nostalgically thinking back to a sort of simpler lifestyle and time. And she really desires and longs for a simpler time in her life rather than feeling like she needs to be concerned with all these bigger issues to do with the country and the world and the environment collapsing and feeling like the world is gonna you know, collapse at any moment. And, and I love how she, she really brings together um, the, the personal and global in that way. Like there's a, a line which um, I think really captures that where she says, uh, the fact that I'm scared anything could happen, anything from finding a rotten egg to us all being obliterated in one second in a nuclear holocaust and there is this persistent feeling that there's, there's danger all around her. And there's a really, uh, really moving symbolic thing at the very beginning of the book where she talks about how their, their house is situated very close to a road and, and how quite often, because it's a dangerous section of the road, motorists might go off the road and, um, and crash into the house. And, um, and so you feel this constant presence of danger that, that it's just lurking around every corner. And I think it's, it's, it really reflects something that we feel a lot of the time. Our recent like, preoccupation with, with terrorism and gun shootings, mass gun shootings in America that just at any moment we could all be wiped out and everything could change for good. And, um, and this sort of reflects on the title of the book in, in a really interesting way of the concept of ducks. Um, so, so ducks do play a, a role in the novel in this, um, this one memory she keeps going back and thinking of, of when her, her mother was young and she, her mother just sort of uh, threw herself into this, this duck pond where, where she um, went after some ducks and, and almost died. And, and so how, um, you know, if, if that had happened and if her mother wasn't stopped, then, you know, she never would have happened. So there's that symbolic weight, but then also there's, she, she constantly refers to um, sitting ducks and this feeling that, that, they're, that we're all just sitting ducks waiting for something to happen to us, waiting for some big calamity to happen in our lives and, and in the larger world and that the whole world can come grind into a halt and, and come to an end. But also going back to literary references, um, I want to talk about a, a couple more that she makes um, because at the end of the, the novel, there's an appendix where she talks about uh, quotes she takes from authors. Um, so there's uh, a lot a uh, lot in the, the book about Rachel Carson as well, who is a great environmental writer. But, uh, but another um, quote she makes is from Edith Wharton, where Edith uh, Wharton uh, writes, I had no one but myself to talk to, and it is absurd to write down what one says to oneself. And it almost feels like Lucy Elman is, is, uh, is taking up that challenge of, of saying that it's absurd to just write down everything that you're saying to yourself because that's really what she's doing. She's, um, she, she's, she's recording everything that she, she thinks. It's, it's really meaningful, I think, the, the way that she does this because it's giving a greater importance to her life of somebody who just thinks of herself as an ordinary housewife, that there is 
importance and weight to all of the thoughts she's having, which are, yes, many of them are trivial and absurd, but many of them are very profound and moving as well and reflect a lot of the things that we're all feeling. And it's, um, and it does become very moving throughout the novel because she, she, um, she really plays herself down. She, um, she, she doesn't, think of herself as important, like going back to the movie It's a Wonderful Life, and she thinks if I'd never been born, um, like the protagonist of It's a Wonderful Life, like probably nothing much would have changed, like there would be a few less pies in the world, but um, but, but nothing else much would change, which is, you know, really sad in a way, because obviously her life is important, because she had four children, and, and she's had all these influences on on people around her in her life and her community um, in ways that she doesn't really understand or appreciate. But then another literary reference I wanna, I have to talk about um, just because it's me and it's um, Joyce Carol Oates and you know, Joyce Carol Oates is my favorite author. And, and um, so there are references to Joyce Carol Oates and specifically to this memoir, um, The Lost Landscape by Joyce Carol Oates. It's just really a group of essays, memoirist essays that Joyce Carol Oates wrote about her life. And, um, and, and she refers to one specific essay where she's talking about her childhood and how her family tried to uh, start a pear orchard when she was younger as a business, as a way of um, sustaining themselves and how this pear orchard failed. And she, keeps, and she I mean, there's only a few references to this, so it's, it's a very minor part of the novel, but just because it's me, I, I need to pick up on it. And it's, it's funny because the, the narrator of Ducks Newbury Port really harp harpens on Joyce Carol Oates that she's like, she's like, why does she hold this against pairs that this occurred? But it's really weird because, I mean, obviously that was really symbolic in her life because Joyce Carol Oates family were very poor and they were trying to make a living. And so to have a, to try to start a business and have it end in this devastating way where they couldn't make it a go, um, yeah, would be really upsetting to her, obviously, and, and pairs would take this symbolic meaning for her. So yeah, it's just, it's just a minor detail that I had to pick up on just because, you know, it's me. But another uh, minor thing that this, this novel does that I want to just point out because I think it's really clever and good and, and really engages you with the narrator is, um, is there'll be certain words which she, um, she acknowledges she doesn't know, which is the white, right word, white, right word to use. Um, so like she'll, she'll pick up on the words affect and effect and she, she doesn't know which right word to use. And, uh, and I have that same thing all the time. Pretty much any time I write the words uh, effect or affect, I have to look up which is the right word to use. Um, even though I know that effect is usually a noun and affect is usually a verb, like I know that logically, I've looked it up enough times that I, I know that and I can look at the sentence structure and know which one should be right. But it's one of those words that you know you just look at constantly and you're like, is that right? Did I get that right? And, uh, and I just found that very relatable. And it's very funny um, how this will recur as the novel goes on. Um, and she, she, um, she, she needs to say either affect or effect. Um, she'll just use both words um, <laughs> rather than trying to decide which word is right, even though later on in the novel she, she does make the right choice sometimes when she, she uses the word. And, so, um, and she does that in a, a number of cases with a number of words. And I just found that very endearing and, and very relatable, and I'm sure a lot of people would too. But then also I want to mention briefly, because this is long listed for the Booker Prize, how I think it's interesting to compare it alongside uh, Milkman by Anna Burns, which won the Booker Prize last year, because in a way, superficially, these novels are quite similar in a way that they are both told in a very like stream of consciousness style that you just get all the jumble of thoughts as um, the, the female protagonists of the books are going about their day. And, um, and also the way that, that the oppressive politics of their time really impacts upon them personally and how they really affect them. Um, but just personally, I want to talk about the comparison because, you know, Milkman is a novel that I've, I've talked about a number of times. I had some difficulty with because there are parts of it which I did find really entertaining and engaging and incredibly moving. There are sections of this book which are just so profoundly written. Um, but then there are other sections of it which I did find really tedious and repetitive and and difficult to read. And, um, and even though it's a shorter novel than this, 
I found this a more constantly engaging novel in that it does have that same thing where there'll be repetitious thoughts or circular thoughts, and there'll also be lists of things. She'll go on about lists of things, um, some of which I think work and some of which don't, like there'll be a long list of sort of American corporations, and she'll, she'll talk about how these corporations try to sell things to families by projecting this image of an ideal family and how her she feels like she needs to fit her family into these advertising ideas of an ideal family. Um, I thought that was really effective. But, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's interesting how it does have a lot of the, the same strong qualities as, as this novel. Um, uh, but, you know, it's told, but there are, you know, a lot of differences in it and in, in the way it's told and, it's, and the, the circumstances of these, these women's lives are obviously very different from each other. But, uh, but yeah, I just think it's very interesting to, to think about them in relation to each other. And finally, um, just because I've been going on this book, I, I could, there's, there's so much more to say about this novel, but um, I'm just going to sum up what I found so relatable about it just because uh, personally, because I like baking a lot too, and obviously there's a lot in this novel about baking, about her thinking about recipes of pies and making cinnamon rolls and hors d'oeuvres for parties, um, and uh, and uh, although how she doesn't like parties because she's a very shy person, and um, you know I found that very relatable too. But also just as somebody who likes to bake, I find it very comforting and enjoyable to to read about somebody else who is a big baker. And there's uh, another good quote in this novel where um, she says. This is exactly why cooking makes me so jittery, because you never know when you're going to screw up big time and waste a lot of ingredients or electricity and all, or just waste time and make a fool of yourself. And that's an anxiety that I think any baker has a lot of the time, knowing that you could spend hours baking something and it might just not come to anything. It might just be a disaster and not work right. And how there's an embarrassment attached attached to that and a shame because you so, sort of feels like a big personal failure, even though it's just a silly, you know, pie you were making or a recipe you were making. But uh, but yeah, it's funny how um, this this novel did make me want to go back and bake more and you know and go back and watch a lot of the movies that it references. And so just to end this this long video, I'm um, talking about this novel. I'm uh, it it did inspire me to make cinnamon rolls for the first time. So I'm going to show my process of making cinnamon rolls, and I have a very simple recipe which um, I'll put up on the screen um, in in text uh, while I'm showing myself baking these cinnamon rolls. But, um, but just to give you a flavor of this novel, I'll read a section from it as well, just to give you an idea of, if you haven't read it, of the rhythm and the style of the novel. And uh, yeah, just um, as a fun way of, uh, of doing a different sort of review of, of uh, you know, combining it with some baking as well. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, let me know if you have read this novel, if you have any thoughts about it, or if you're really tempted to read this novel, um, let me know. Or if uh, yeah, you feel intimidated by the sense that it's, it's a very big book. But personally, in my opinion, I think it's hugely enjoyable and hugely worthwhile to go through it because even though it is filled with so much seemingly trivial detail, um, the accumulation of it, of uh, this... It gives a, a really rounded sense of her life in general and also the state of the world and modern life. So I think there's a huge amount of, in it that's relatable, um, but also that's really touching and moving as a portrait of, of her life specifically. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And uh, now, yeah, let's uh, enjoy having some cinnamon rolls. <laughs> the fact that replacing a whole window will cost about a thousand bucks and we don't have an extra thou just knocking around. Foreclosure, executive lounge, chaise lounge, Charles River, rowboat, twisted sticks of straw. The fact that we're broke because I had cancer. The fact that that broke us. It broke us. The fact that I shouldn't say that because here we are still kicking and I am still producing cinnamon rolls by the ton. But sciatica, hip, Advil, painkillers, Leo's health plan, the fact that Phoebe helped us out and will never be able to pay her back, and Jake was at the height of his cute stage, and I missed it. You missed it, Oscar, you missed it. And that hurts. Landa Lakes, seal test, zip and zest, Jake's cat kibble habit, sun-made raisins, alphabet noodles, diapers, donuts, diapers for donuts, the fact that there was some kind of kibble from China that killed a whole lot of dogs and cats all over America a while back, but that was over long before Jake got interested in cat kibble, luckily. The fact that 
Only last week, though, they had to recall some Chinese dog chews. Snowstorm. The fact that they weren't lethal or fatal or anything. Fake. Shake. Imam. Pharaoh. Cleopatra. The Sphinx. Sphinxy. The fact that they just made some dogs sick. The fact that a dog shouldn't pass away from eating a dog chew, of all things. That's for darn certain. Or from eating kibble, either. Dog kibble. Dribble. Drizzle. Lemon drizzle cake. The fact that just doesn't seem fair. You're darn tootin'. Insurance. Retreat. Endearing. Enduring. BLM. The fact that the kids are always saying things aren't fair. The fact that that's their motto. Their mantra. Fondue. The fact that you never know what's in kibble. You're just supposed to trust the manufacturers. The fact that kibble factories must have quite an odor, I bet. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. Iago. The fact that Leo says he never thinks about Shakespeare. The fact that Shakespeare never comes into his head. The fact that the cat kibble we've got is American. But anyway, Jake now eats nothing but SpaghettiOs. Damsons you have to leave unstoned. And I don't know what to do about it. This SpaghettiO fixation of his. The fact that I have not read all the books I want to read. Not even half. The fact that it doesn't take all that long to read a book, so I don't know why I don't. Except that the kids always interrupt if I try to read anything. The fact that even the cats interrupt. The fact that the last thing I read was about how noble all the Amish were about the nickel mines massacre. The fact that that horror really was unfair. The fact that those children were not just maimed and killed, but frightened out of their wits. The fact that I just spent a few hours baking cinnamon rolls. The fact that baking cinnamon rolls from scratch isn't as easy as it seems. Scratch that itch. Match. Catch. How to catch a thief. Cary Grant and Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly. Harlow Jean. Picture of a beauty queen. The fact that you can't eat cinnamon rolls and stay as thin as Grace Kelly. The fact that baking means that you have fatty foods lying around the house. The fact that I don't care and I'm gonna eat a cinnamon roll anyway because it smells so gosh darn good. Oh. <laughs>